professor of uh, political science, University of uh, San Diego, and also a member of uh, the TPF governing council. The event will be chaired by Air Marshal Mateshwaran, president of the Peninsula Foundation. And I welcome other experts and participants in the audience who have joined us today. This discussion could not be more timely since the heightened uh, tensions between Russia and the West over Ukraine is keeping everyone else on their toes, foreboding a possible outbreak of war in Eastern Europe. So I hope you all will benefit from this important discussion today. And please feel free to enter your questions in the chat box or raise your hand during the interaction session. Thank you. Thank you, Madhavanti. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Ambassador Raghavan, uh, Professor Andre Parappa, and Professor Vidya Narkani for today's uh, uh, discussions. Uh, the topic is obviously uh, Ukraine-Russia crisis and the fear of war. And uh, the question is, uh, is it rhetoric or reality? Let's examine that part. Uh, the, uh, there's a whole lot of, uh, you know, a gamut of uh, strategies and uh, geopolitics that are involved. And I'm sure the experts will bring a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, wealth of information on that during the discussions. Uh, it's, it's indeed a great pleasure to have Ambassador uh, Raghun with us. Uh, he's a former ambassador, Indian ambassador in Moscow. And he's also been ambassador in Czechoslovakia and in Ireland. And uh, it, uh, it brings a wealth of experience and, ex and knowledge of the region, particularly in the Russia's uh, strategic perceptions. Uh, and of course, uh, he's also been convener of the National Security Advisory Board. Uh, and uh, you can't ask for a better person to actually for, look at India's interests and perspectives in this particular crisis. Yeah. Uh, Ambassador Raghavan has also uh, uh, been uh, intimately involved in advising the government. And he was earlier with the PMO as well in areas of foreign relations, in areas of nuclear energy, in areas of uh, technologies uh, and defense and national security domains. He is an alumni of the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, and he is also a distinguished fellow in various think tanks in the country, like the Vekananda International Center, as well as the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore. Uh, welcome, sir, on board. Let me also welcome uh, uh, Professor Andre Korupkov. Uh, he is the Professor of Political Science in Middle Tennessee University, State University. And he's an expert on, uh, you know, the uh, uh, this, uh, studies with respect to, particularly with respect to Russia, migration, geopolitics, and and uh, and the Eastern Europe uh, issues. So he's also a regular, you know, uh, uh, expert who comes on board in MGMO events, uh, the Russian Foreign Ministry, uh, uh, you know, institution, as well as in Valde Club. And, and uh, his recent interview in BBC with respect to the Ukrainian crisis has also been very well received. Uh, he's, uh, he writes uh, very frequently, he's a prolific writer, and he's also our adjunct, you know, distinguished fellow for the Peninsula Foundation. Uh, so uh, his knowledge on Russia is not the Eastern Europe, and, and of course, in this present crisis will be a great, you know, uh, uh, input for us to uh, listen to him. And I welcome uh, Professor Vidya Natkani, uh, uh, Professor of Political Science from San Diego, University of San Diego. And her expertise lies in, uh, in, in studying the emerging powers that is Russia, China, and India, their interactions, and their interests. And she's written, again, a prolific writer. She's written a series of books relating to the BRICS and the Russia, India, China uh, relations. Uh, you can't have a better person to moderate the discussions today. And uh, Vidya, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you on board with us today. Uh, without taking any more time, let me now hand over the proceedings to Vidya to you know, take the discussions forward. Vidya, all yours. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be moderating uh, a discussion uh, between two um, distinguished uh, speakers uh, as we have today. Uh, I'm just going to set the stage very quickly. And uh, for those of you who just joined in, uh, the um, uh, way in which we're going to conduct this panel is 
uh, that each of the um, speakers will um, talk for about 10 minutes and then I will moderate a discussion between them. And um, uh, up to about, um, um, I'm trying to think what the time is there, 7.30. Uh, and, and then for the last half hour, we will have audience questions and uh, then a little time for closing comments from the two speakers. Uh, so um, as, as has already been mentioned, we are in a crisis that continues to escalate. Uh, just before I uh, um, joined in, I checked the news and it uh, looks as if uh, the people in the separatist republics are uh, mobilizing and um, the uh, rhetoric certainly on the US side is uh, that an invasion will occur at any moment. And the um, Russian foreign ministry and President Putin have been consistently saying that uh, they have no plans for an invasion. So that's where things stand. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, challenges in Ukraine so that the um, problems with Ukraine are longstanding. Uh, there was the 2004 um, color revolution, the orange revolution uh, in Ukraine. And I'm sure um, uh, Professor Korobkov will talk about it in his comments. Uh, and then in uh, 2010, uh, the um, uh, battle between Yanukovych and Yushchenko for the presidency of Ukraine. And in, in all of these uh, events, uh, the United States and Russia have um, been on opposite sides. Uh, and the current crisis really started uh, in November, December of last year uh, with uh, President Putin uh, making the argument that Russia's legitimate security um, concerns should be addressed and asking the West to provide a guarantee that Ukraine will not uh, join NATO. And, and the crisis has been escalating since. So I will stop there and give uh, Ambassador Raghavan and Professor Korobkov about eight to 10 minutes for opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to uh, uh, my co-panelists as well as to the audience. Thank you very much to start with. Thank you very much to the Peninsula Foundation for uh, inviting me to join this very uh, interesting discussion uh, on a subject which, of course, is now dominating every TV screen in all the countries uh, where we are and, and every drawing room conversation. Um, as, the, uh, as our moderator, Professor Natkarni, mentioned, it is, it's now developing into something like a, uh, something of a high-voltage drama and uh, as befitting a proper gripping drama. Every day you have a new revelation which which grips your interest and uh, and 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 of course uh, scares you as well. So we've reached a stage where you know if it was not so scary, it would be surreal. Uh, and it's particularly surreal if you look at it from where it began to where we have reached. Uh, I would, uh, uh, Professor Natkarni, you said that it started in. Uh, uh, November, December, I would date the starting of this to June last year, because that is when Prof uh, President Biden reached out his hand to President Putin and said that I want to have a, a predictable and stable relationship with the uh, with Russia, because he said that we should cooperate in, in, in resolving global issues. And of course, the subtext was uh, uh, for President Biden that, look, I need to focus primarily on my domestic issues, which is COVID, which is infrastructure, which is the various democratic issues, the issues of democracy that are there. And externally, I want to focus on our principal adversary, principal strategic rival, if you like, which is China. And therefore, it was an expression of the American desire to sort of disengage from what it saw as needless and fractious, uh, infractuous conflicts. Uh, that is the reason why they uh, withdrew from the US, uh, from, sorry, from Afghanistan as well. And so, you know, get out of these conflicts in Europe and uh, West Asia and so on and, and deal with this principal adversary. So, and then if you look at it thereafter, there was a very satisfactory progress in negotiations between the two countries, talks on strategic stability, which now are 
when you talk about mutual security guarantees today, that's actually dealt with in the strategic stability. You talked about cyber crimes, and there was this, this host of American visitors to Russia which talked about exactly what are the issues today, which is uh, NATO, Ukraine, Minsk agreements, mutual security guarantees, all of this. And then you suddenly see this buildup which took place over, actually it started in end October, but it started getting noticed only in November, December, and then it rises to a crescendo. And there again, it's very odd because today the US is talking up the prospects of war uh, every day saying that, you know, there are 100,000 to 150,000 to 200,000 and artillery and air cover, et cetera, et cetera. The Russians are keeping very quiet, except that from time to time they say that you have no uh, intention of invading. The Ukrainians are saying that, look, panic actually helps the adversary. So please do not uh, yeah. panic to us. So, so it's a very strange situation. And the other issue also is, which is also equally bizarre, that while there is this strong and harsh rhetoric, and there is this, whether it's US, the NATO, European countries saying that, you know, we will never give in to blackmail from Russia. Underneath that, you also see the gentle hints that Russian demands are being met and, in fact, publicly being acknowledged. If you talk about Ukraine and NATO, President Biden himself, is, uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, uh, the, the Secretary of State Blinken, uh, you look at Olaf Schulz in Kiev or in Moscow, you look at President Macron in uh, Kiev and in Moscow, they're all saying that, you know, NATO, uh, Ukraine joining NATO is not on the agenda. And then you go to uh, the other aspect. The other aspect is, of course, about Minsk agreements. Uh, they were all pretty coy. The Americans in particular were pretty coy about mentioning the Minsk agreements. They were talking about the Normandy process. And the Russian complaint always was that, you know, the Normandy process is being used to kind of uh, amend the Minsk agreement. But you see now at the Security Council, Secretary Blinken very clearly said that we stand by, we endorse the Minsk agreement. Uh, again, the French and the Germans are saying exactly that. Uh, so, uh, oh, beneath this rhetoric, you are moving towards very, and then about the last point, which is uh, the third of the Russian demands, which is mutual security guarantees. I think that is, I've described it as a low-hanging fruit, actually, because that is something on which interests of the two sides actually coincide very largely, including the European interests. And you saw this televised, very orchestrated televised uh, meeting of uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov with President Putin where he actually said that this is what has been offered. I'll just refer to what, uh, what he said. He said that the, uh, the US and NATO have offered reciprocal and mutually verifiable moratorium on the deployment of shorter and intermediate range uh, missiles, measures to move military exercises away from the line of contact between Russia and NATO, and to agree on a minimum distance for the uh, approach of military aircraft and warship, and a number of other uh, confidence building measures. So if you look at it, there is a package out there which appears to be negotiable. Of course, the maximalist demands that Russia has made were exactly that. They were maximalist so that they could fall back onto uh, something that uh, uh, suits their uh, requirement. So I think, you know, the elements of a settlement are there. And yet you have this harsh rhetoric going on, Russia being coy about uh, when it's going to withdraw and what it's going to do. My own suspicion, and this is my hypothesis, it is that Russia is trying to see whether they can secure the last of, the, of what they want, which is, you know, the details of the Minsk agreement. The Minsk agreement, yes, the other, everyone has said that they will accept it, but the Minsk agreements has, have many complications within it. You know, you, while, while the uh, Ukraine has questioned some of the sequencing, which is not uh, acceptable to the Russians. Also, when you come down to the fine print, you have to determine where you draw the line of the uh, Donbass region, what kind of special status you will have, how you will conduct the election. My own feeling is that the Russians would like to see that these are tied up in some kind of an assurance that this will move forward in a proper way before they withdraw. So in my, in my view, it's a kind of an orchestrated uh, drama that you can see. And, and also, it is also you need to overcome some of the Ukrainian objections because the single greatest opponent of the Minsk agreements has been Ukraine because they feel in some way their sovereignty over that 
area would be uh, undermined. And, and the U.S. so far has been, you know, you know the, the whole thing about the Minsk agreements is over the last seven years, the U.S. has been supporting Ukraine in actually resisting the implementation. But friends and the Germans from time to time have tried to do it. So I think that is where we are. Uh, I, I do not believe for a moment that either side wants war. I do not believe that, you know, I think from looking at it from uh, the Russian perspective, I think a war will destroy its negotiating position. It finishes its negotiating position. It is as long as it is threatening war and not doing it. The other thing, of course, is that a war would be very unpopular in, in, in Russia itself uh, for a variety of reasons. And they have nothing to gain by war. And the same on the other side, you know, you can keep talking about harsh sanctions, but everyone knows that sanctions may hurt Russia greatly, but they'll equally hurt the global economy and Europe and the US. You don't want oil at $110 a barrel and a 10% inflation. Right? And the fact that Russia will suffer does not really, uh, is not much of a consolation in a democratic society. Uh, but, so, so, you know, everything argues against war, everything argues towards the settlement. The only problem is that some hotheads, some uh, people who want to sabotage it, should not start something unintended, and then the whole thing goes down the precipice. That is the danger in brinkmanship, which is which I think we need to avoid. I think I'll stop here. I, I may not have uh, exceeded my time. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Raghavan. Uh, Professor Korobkov. Uh, thank you, Vidya. Uh, well, first of all, thank you to Peninsula Foundation and to Vice Marshal Mathis Farron for inviting me. Uh, this is a, a very hot topic right now, and uh, I want to start by saying that I completely agree with my uh, counterpart uh, in a sense that uh, I think it's an organized chaos that Putin starts, uh, so continues to stir a problem uh, without having an intention of going to war. Uh, at the same time, there is a very risky situation and uh, uh, lots of analysts, especially in Europe, remember June 1914, uh, August 2008, and a number of other situations when uh, great powers um, could play political games and then the minor players were interfering uh, with disastrous results. Um, well, uh, if we talk about Putin specifically and uh, returning to something that uh, was just mentioned, um, just uh, 10 minutes ago, I was watching CNN and there one of uh, economists said, well, if there is war, well, we'll have, or even prolonged tensions, will have at least 1%, 1 percentage point decline in GDP next year and inflation going way above 10%. And uh, this is a conundrum, for example, Biden finds himself in. Uh, he, uh, to some extent, gains from the tension in Europe because, well, it distracts attention from internal problems. But uh, if it continues, if there is no resolution, then uh, it will hurt uh, his and the Democrat ratings tremendously, while Putin doesn't have to, well, uh, bother himself with ratings as much as Biden, to put it mildly. Uh, well, uh, the current crisis is interesting because it brought together these uh, three, uh, well, very important shifts. On the one hand, uh, Ukraine was going for the last 30 years since its formation, uh, as an independent state through the process, among other things, of uh, state and nation building. It's a very painful process always, in case of Ukraine especially, first, because its identity from uh, Russia uh, never was completely separated. They always were kind of formed and perceived as a single unit. Uh, when Ukraine was formed, its population was 52 million. Of these 52, 12 million were ethnic Russians, uh, and the rest were divided, roughly speaking, between Eastern uh, and Western Ukrainians, uh, having a very different view on Russia, on Russian language, uh, and uh, the formation of a single Ukrainian nation under these conditions was very complicated to start with. Meanwhile, Ukraine found itself uh, between a rock and a hard place between Russia and uh, the West, 
uh, and both sides were actively interfering into these processes. Second process uh, uh, is and was uh, the, uh, well, huge geopolitical shifts that are taking place currently. And the third is the internal political and, uh, well, socioeconomic crisis in the United States that uh, complicates, uh, well, uh, the uh, political processes in general worldwide. So if we talk about uh, uh, the uh, Russian perspective, uh, exactly 15 years ago in February uh, 2007, uh, well, Putin gave his famous Munich speech in which he basically outlined the Russian position. It was, well, the balance of power is changing. Uh, there emerges second superpower. There, there emerges, uh, uh, well, a number of uh, great world powers. It including, uh, includes the rebirth of Russia. It includes India. It includes Brazil, uh, a number of other potential players. Uh, the center of the world uh, system is moving Europe and moving to uh, the North uh, Pacific. And therefore, rules of the game have to change. Well, uh, uh, Russia has to be treated uh, equally by the West and uh, uh, Russian uh, demands have to be taken into account. The Western reaction was basically, ah, well, uh, we can ignore uh, Russian demands. We're still strong. We're still the center uh, of the world system. And we were at the center of the world system, roughly speaking from 1492, since the world system was created and Europeans established control over it and, quite frankly, uh, started to take advantage over the system. And then 15 years pass uh, after uh, four turbulent years of uh, Trump, there is a, a new president in the White House, the president who is extremely weak, uh, both because uh, he uh, relies on a very uh, well weak majority in Congress, especially in the Senate, and because his ratings go down. Then there comes a disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, a number of other events, uh, and uh, uh, Putin starts acting. So there emerges a letter from uh, Soviet foreign, uh, Russian foreign ministry to uh, the State Department, then a similar letter to NATO, uh, and there, uh, all the demands that were given uh, 15 years ago are spelled out again and reiterated. Specifically, it is being said that uh, the balance has changed. The US now is not the only superpower. Europe is losing its uh, significance, probably for good, forever. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, Russian demands have to be taken into account. And now it's not a suggestion. It's a demand. When uh, the West responded, its response was, A, we cannot negotiate these issues in, as a single package. Let's discuss them separately. B, we cannot put uh, well, our agreements in writing because well, we, uh, we don't want to limit either our sovereignty or sovereignty of potential uh, well, members of NATO. And of course, it was meant, even though uh, not spelled out in democratic systems under the conditions of division of powers, well, such a document would not uh, be uh, possible through legislature. It would not be ratified. So uh, what are Putin's demands? First of all, uh, the written guarantees of uh, non-proliferation uh, of NATO, uh, NATO not admitting new uh, members, especially uh, out of uh, the former Soviet republics, including Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, first of all. Uh, second, guarantees that uh, NATO uh, weapons, especially uh, the uh, medium range missiles and uh, uh, anti ballistic systems, uh, will not be stationed on the eastern borders of NATO. Uh, besides that, uh, uh, well, there were other demands, but the Western position was, first of all, we cannot fulfill these uh, demands and we will not do that. Uh, well, uh, on February 19th, uh, uh, the, uh, Der Spiegel German uh, journal has published uh, uh, information that uh, uh, a written 
written notes were found that uh, proved that there was such an agreement between uh, NATO and uh, uh, the Soviet Union yet. Uh, guaranteeing the uh, well uh, non-admittance of uh, former Soviet republics to NATO. So it will be interesting to see how this uh, situation evolves, but it is clear <coughs> that positions differ significantly. The West is not willing, at least up to this moment, to uh, make any concessions. And then Putin started to act. So he started to increase pressure on Ukraine. Uh, and uh, um, my impression is that uh, it is really a game. He does not intend to uh, well go to war, uh, but he puts uh, Western leaders and Biden, first of all, in a very tough situation. Well, um, Biden, uh, claimed that uh, invasion would start uh, on Wednesday. It did not start uh, immediately. Uh, well, his opponents and journalists in general started saying, okay, this is the third time. We, uh, we've been uh, lied to by uh, intelligence and administration. And uh, uh, parallels were drawn, US leaving uh, South Vietnam in 1975, uh, while well, U.S. leaving Afghanistan in 2021, uh, U.S. Uh, leaving the uh, embassy in Kiev and moving to Lviv to the west of the country, 2022. Um, and uh, uh, now the administration has announced that invasion is uh, imminent again. It will happen next week. If it doesn't happen again, uh, of course, it uh, hurts credibility of uh, Biden personally a lot and uh, even worse than um, hurting credibility, uh, we see an extreme instability on the stock market uh, and it will probably lead to the decline of uh, all economic indicators. And this in a situation when uh, Biden has already established an anti-record and uh, uh, his popularity is falling. It has fallen first among the moderates and now the same happens in regard to, uh, well, the most important electoral groups for the Democrats, uh, Hispanics, uh, African-Americans, and uh, um, other groups as well. Therefore, uh, it's a very complicated uh, game on the part of Putin, but a game that uh, can be dangerous uh, because there is a lot of, uh, uh, well, uh, minor players both in Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, these so-called People's Republics, and uh, uh, in Ukraine itself, via various paramilitary groups. And the longer it goes, the um, higher is the danger of provocation. Now, uh, there is another problem here. If we remember the Caribbean Missile Crisis, uh, well, uh, at some point, one of the sites, sites has to blink. And uh, uh, the longer it goes, the, the uh, dangerous it becomes to blink because, well, you might lose your face. Uh, this uh, also has to be taken uh, in the account. Uh, well, uh, right now uh, we hear voices. Ironically, this time, many of these voices come from the right in the US saying, well, is it worth it from the point of view of US security? Clearly, our interests are moving from Europe to Asia. It's basically, un under it is understood by everybody. What is the strategic value of uh, Ukraine for us? The most famous proponent of this uh, uh, point of view is John Mearsheimer from University of Chicago. But this now is uh, being spelled out by a number of politicians and uh, uh, well, uh, media figures as well, for example, Tucker Carlson at Fox. So uh, this pressure uh, gives uh, some results, uh, but for um, <clears throat> Putin, as I already have mentioned, uh, there are uh, costs here too. First, the <clears throat> potential, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, the potential introduction of sanctions. Second, the uh, possibility of uh, uh, explosion uh, at the border. Uh, and uh, uh, well, third, it's the uh, internal issue. Here, uh, there is an interesting situation. For many years, 
uh, sa sanctions have been discussed, new sanctions uh, uh, by the West against Russia. Uh, the list is known. It's the uh, cutting uh, Russia of the SWIFT system. Uh, it's uh, the uh, blocking uh, of operations in the West of a number of major Russian banks, including Sberbank. It's the ban on dollar operations and hard currency operations in general of the Russian banks. Uh, it's uh, 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 some kind of action against the uh, Nord Stream uh, 2 and other uh, Russian uh, facilities supplying gas and oil to the West. It's a new set of sanctions that uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, kind of the repetition of the uh, well uh, uh, initial uh, policy of the Cold War, the uh, rebuilding of COCOM system, uh, blocking sales of high-tech uh, equipment uh, and technology to Russia. And these are personal uh, sanctions against the Russian oligarchs. The irony is that each of these sanctions can potentially backfire uh, uh, to the West. Uh, they are practically guaranteed to push uh, for the economic crisis that we're already staying on the verge of. Uh, it uh, can hurt uh, Europe a lot in terms of uh, prices of uh, oil, gas, and energy in general. And of course, for Biden, who is uh, hanging by a thread, it's a tremendous political danger as well. Uh, and uh, the last thing that should be mentioned, of course, the giant six pound gorilla that uh, uh, is always present right now, whenever doors uh, between, say, Putin and Biden close is China. Uh, well, uh, basically, to all these challenges, uh, Putin now can say, uh, OK, and uh, you know what? In response, we'll form an alliance with China. He demonstrated it at the start of the Olympic Games. I wouldn't be surprised if something happens right after the end of the Olympic Games. And it's not only about political or military alliance, it's also about the uh, economic side to it. Uh, the irony is that Europeans might uh, soon be forced to compete for uh, Russian energy and basically be beg for it. Because if uh, uh, new pipelines are built uh, to the East, China would be easily able to buy all uh, energy that Russia can offer. And this is changing everything. Uh, when Trump was uh, in the White House, his uh, uh, chief uh, strategist, uh, Steve Bannon, uh, wrote, and he wrote it yet in uh, 2015, that the main goal of uh, American uh, foreign policy should be stopping China. And that de facto meant that there were only two options, either uh, Russia would be with the US against China or uh, Russia will be with China against the US. That was the foundation of this uh, policy. Uh, well, all attempts by Trump to change uh, the situation, change the tone of uh, uh, interaction with uh, uh, Russia have led nowhere, both because elite did not buy it and because um, Trump was a systemic threat to American elite and it would resist anything uh, he was doing. It didn't matter at all what uh, was he doing. Uh, when uh, Trump got defeated, uh, uh, Europeans were euphoric. They thought that uh, everything is uh, coming back uh, and uh, uh, Europe will return to the center of American uh, attention. And it turned out that Biden has changed tone but did not change the goals of American foreign policy at all. Uh, the shift continues. It creates a political vacuum. Uh, and uh, the, this political vacuum leads to, uh, well, the situation that uh, we have now. We see a kind of uh, interesting and to some extent ironic attempts by the United Kingdom to fill in this vacuum, uh, even form some kind of uh, regional alliances in Eastern Europe. Uh, but it is clear that uh, first the UK does not have the potential to play the role of uh, the great power right now. And second, uh, I uh, very seriously doubt that uh, Germany and France have any desire 
to see uh, Britain back at, at the continent in a role, in a role of uh, keeper of the balance or creator uh, of its own alliances. I see that I exceeded my time limit video, so I will probably stop here and well, we'll be glad to discuss uh, specific issues now during discussion. Okay. Um, there are several important points both of you brought up. And so let's disaggregate those points and take them one by one. Um, the first of them is NATO. Um, if, if you recall, NATO was very divided um, during the uh, Trump presidency. And uh, there is some commentary uh, both at the policy level and among scholars uh, that what has happened with the Ukraine crisis is that NATO now is more unified than it had been. Uh, what is your view on the future of NATO? And um, is it going to weaken as a result of the crisis or is it going to strengthen? Uh, uh, Ambassador Raghavan. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, you, you, you say that NATO was divided during President Trump's uh, presidency. I would argue that NATO has been divided at many times in the past. In fact, in 2003, when the US uh, went into Iraq, NATO was very badly divided. Uh, it was not NATO, it is the current NATO that was badly divided. The sense that the new Europe and the old Europe were badly divided, the whole new Europe is now in NATO. Now, see, I, I would like to make a fundamental point about NATO and where Europe is with NATO today. Uh, NATO grew as a politico-military alliance during the Cold War, uh, when there was a smaller and more uh, coherent Europe, which faced two threats. One was the ideological threat of communism coming out of uh, Russia, of Soviet Union, and the other was an existential military threat. Now, that was the glue that bound NATO together within Europe and with the uh, US. Now, once you have, uh, the Soviet Union has collapsed, whatever you say about Russia, it is not communist anymore. So that the advance of communism is not a threat. And the existential military threat, now with the widening of NATO, you know, NATO had 14 European countries, then it now has 28 European countries. I mean, even if you leave out Turkey and UK now, it still is a predominant. And they have a different outlook on the military threat from Russia. Therefore, you know, the glue that held NATO together before does not, it does not hold it together. So, yes, Trump actually accelerated the process, but you see now countries, uh, the France and Germany and others really talking about a strategic autonomy for Europe talking about Europe's ability to act beyond its borders in its security interests. You know, the, the talk which in 2000 had been started with the Americans actually suppressed I mean, the Lisbon agenda and the common security and defense policy about European army, it is, it is now coming up again. And, and I think this is a stage where this is also happening side by side, when Europe is searching for a security order, which gives it a certain amount of strategic autonomy. I mean, Trump's famous question, again, it was with Tucker Carlson, actually, when Tucker Carlson asked Trump that, why, will you, if uh, Montenegro is attacked, will you, go, uh, will you go in support of it? And uh, Trump said, that's what I'm asking myself. The, uh, whether whether uh, American NATO will go in support of every country in Europe. And, and I think this is a very valid question which countries in Europe are well aware of. Though you, you hide it under the uh, frequent uh, Article 5 uh, 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 reiteration. So I think there is a fundamental churn within Europe. And now NATO is Europe. Europe is NATO. European Union and NATO both will become identical very soon because every country which is in NATO and not in the European Union, almost every country will, will be part of NATO. When you leave out Ireland and countries like that, which are NATO. So, you know, you're really talking about a churn in Europe itself, which is going to determine to what extent NATO will remain united and bound to the transatlantic alliance, especially as America is, as Professor Korobko also mentioned, America is looking at China. And therefore, President Biden in his last visit to Europe was trying to get Europe interested in China. He was even trying to get NATO interested in China to form, uh, to look at China really rather than. So all of this will have its impact on NATO as well, I think. 
Mm. Vidya, I, I would like to also to add a little bit. Uh, well, <clears throat> NATO, <clears throat> I'm sorry, NATO is important as long as the United States guarantees its security. Without the US, NATO is totally irrelevant, even with the British and French nuclear weapons. And that's, uh, <clears throat> that's the irony of it. Uh, Trump was uh, openly in your face uh, telling Europeans, you need us, we don't need you. And therefore, we'll treat you not as equal partners, but as client states. So of course, uh, they uh, did not like it. But uh, uh, that's uh, basically the reality. By the middle of the century, there will be only two European countries among 10 leading economic powers of the world. Britain will be number nine. Germany will be number, number 10. By the end of the century, there wouldn't be a single European country among 10 major economic powers. Europeans know these figures, but of course don't want to recognize that uh, their uh, rule over the world that lasted for 500 years is coming to an end. And thus they will fight for uh, retaining this status. They would pretend as uh, all uh, collapsing empires uh, before them, uh, that they, they still are relevant. It's uh, very visible in the behavior of the uh, United Kingdom right now. Uh, well, and uh, essentially I already said it, uh, that uh, Biden has changed the uh, tone of relationship with Europeans compared to Trump. He didn't change the essence. It is clear that Americans uh, are turning away, political vacuum is forming. Uh, Europeans are to some extent panicking and uh, uh, some are trying to take advantage of the situation like the UK. Others simply say we have to recognize the reality as Germans and uh, it, uh, uh, it will uh, not go away. And uh, uh, basically Putin, both by his statements and by his action, uh, well, sends this signal that we know that rules of the game are changing and okay, you can ignore us, but next time uh, conversation will be already very different. It happened compared to Munich, uh, well, the change of these 15 years, but it will keep happening. Uh, and uh, every time the tone of this conversation uh, uh, will be becoming harsher and harsher, it, it is absolutely clear. I, I also want to add literally a couple of words. I mentioned the sanctions that uh, were uh, at least being discussed. And here uh, are two caveats. First, the introduction of any of those sanctions would probably push for economic crisis. And uh, for uh, Biden, first of all, it will be a total political disaster. And he, uh, he knows it. And that's one of the reasons why sanctions are being talked about and nothing happens. But there is also an issue of the effectiveness of these sanctions. The uh, closer economic ties between Russia and China, the less effective these sanctions become. Uh, and uh, uh, some of these sanctions uh, uh, are spelled out for the internal consumption. In reality, they can lead to the result opposite to uh, the desired one. For example, the introduction of personal sanctions against uh, the oligarchs and uh, uh, Putin's inner circle. I would say that Putin would be just happy if these sanctions are introduced. They will guarantee his total and final control over the Russian elite. Uh, we've seen it uh, uh, in uh, the last uh, couple of years in regard to visa war between the US in Russia. Okay, it became practically impossible to get American visa in uh, Russia. It is very hard to get this visa even going to uh, the third countries. And who gained? Who was primarily traveling from Russia to the United States? People who uh, were basically pro-Western and uh, uh, interested in uh, uh, well, expanding uh, American influence in Russia. So uh, the same probably would happen in this case, but quite frankly, nobody cares because uh, the tragedy of US policy is that it operates on the basis of two year electoral terms. And uh, it is a very big problem for US relations with Russia. It will be a total disaster for the US relations with China. 
Uh, and uh, uh, this is something, uh, well, objective that, um, well, the US would not be able to deal with uh, in the very near future. Thank you. Uh, one of the points that came up in this conversation was the uh, transition of power uh, and that the center of power was going to move to Asia. Uh, and let me probe both of you a little more on this. Um, the uh, Clearly uh, what's happening now is pushing Russia into the arms of uh, China. And so from the US perspective, uh, it makes sense to enlist the help of Russia uh, in its um, um, battles against uh, China. India is in a very tricky position here because India is friends with both uh, Russia and uh, the United States. And so I'd just like to get both of you to address some of the complexities uh, in that very um, um, complicated uh, set of relationships, uh, the United States, China, Russia, India. Uh, that 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 um, set of relationships, uh, Ambassador Raghavan, and then Professor Korobkov, or the other way around. Mm -hmm. Professor, uh, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, just a couple of words. The irony of the situation is that Putin has absolutely no desire to form an alliance with China. He does everything to avoid. Uh, doing it. He perceives Russia as a part of European civilization first. Second, he knows very well that there are deep underlying uh, conflicts of interest between Russia and China. And third, he knows that uh, you cannot uh, be an equal partner to China. Under the circumstances, considering the difference in uh, economic potentials and in general. So he is doing in everything possible to avoid uh, this happening for the formation of alliance. But the irony is that the West, while realizing that uh, there is such a danger, is doing everything to push Russia into not very warm, uh, well, Chinese uh, uh, hug. Well, uh, and uh, it probably will happen now, even though, uh, again, it goes uh, totally contrary to uh, Putin's wishes the wishes of uh, uh, the Russian elite that wants to travel to London and buy apartments there and not say in Shanghai or um, anything like that. But the Western policy, uh, well, essentially makes it inevitable. And that's the irony of the situation, I think. Ambassador Raghavan. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll come back to what I, uh, in my view, is the real underlying meaning of this dispute that is going on now. It is what by, I believe Biden was offering to President Putin, a compact, a political compact, saying, listen, we will stop uh, acrimony between each other so that I am left free as America to deal with China. And Essentially, all that is happening today is President Putin saying, yes, I will accept that political compact provided you give me the security guarantee so that I do not believe that I am being threatened by NATO and other US interests all across my periphery from the Black Sea to the, from the Baltic to the Black Sea to the Caucasus to the Caspian to uh, all the way to Asia. So I think this, this the struggle that is going on now the point that Professor Koropko made was valid that President Biden still has to persuade his own elite and his own political elite within the US to, to take forward this political compact. But I think this is the compact that he had in mind, uh, as, as the professor said, that Biden also is following the Trump uh, line on China, even though it did with different tone and emphasis. So if this works out and if eventually both the leaders get off the tigers that they are sitting on, because both are sitting on tigers and both have to find a way of getting off them in a face saving manner. But if that happens, that can only be good for, well, certainly good for India, because that means that the US engagement with India in the Indo Pacific will become stronger. And that is important for India in the context of China. But, and, and if it doesn't happen, that uh, 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 US, which is bogged down in European theater, is not really, uh, does not make life for India any easier. But on the other hand, 
You know, we've seen this US-Russia acrimony for the last seven years now. And we have had to deal with Russia in, on a variety of fronts because we have a challenge on our continental flank. I mean, not just our strategic interests are not only in the maritime domain, they're also in the continental. And the continental, you're facing China across the border. You have this entire space of Central Asia extending up from Caspian to the uh, Caucasus, where we need to engage with Russia very closely in our interests. And we need to keep an eye on the Russia-China dynamics. And now with Turkey and Iran and others entering that uh, area, all the more reason why we need. And we need a, a link to Central Asia through Iran that again brings Russia into it. So, And this is something that we have had to, our diplomacy has had to deal with the US even during the worst years of the US-Russia acrimony. And why is that so? Let's go back to the US-India relationship. You know, one of the basis, the strategic basis of the US-India relationship is a cooperation which the US saw as beneficial to it in the context of China. Even in, even in 2000 onward, when we really built our strategic partnership with the US, uh, Condoleezza Rice has written about it in her book. She was the NSA at that time. And we dealt with her. I was in the prime minister's office at that time. And we had extensive interactions with the US in this. But very clearly, she says that you know, we saw a strong India in, in South Asia as a counterpoise to the US, uh, to China. And in fact, the, the State Department officials made a statement saying that we are committed to the military strength of India in South Asia. Now, the US knows perfectly well that our military strength comes from the defense cooperation with Russia. We, we have expanded hugely our defense cooperation with the US, but still nowhere near the kind of depth of technology transfers that we are getting from Russia. The US knows that perfectly well. So the US has been making a lot of noises about sanctions. The US has been making a lot of noises expecting us to, to, to sort of side with the US against Russia. But it understands perfectly well the, the, the compulsions that uh, bind us to Russia. And, and it will, even if you are going to diversify your military acquisitions, it's going to take a few years to do that. So we have been doing that. But of course, if there is a US-Russia modus vivendi, it will be much easier for Russia, for India, to pursue our relationship both with the US and with, uh, and, and with uh, Russia simultaneously. And the other thing is that, you know, China should be interested in letting this, I think Professor mentioned it as well, in letting this conflict carry on because that leaves China free to pursue its own ambitions and to bestride the global stage as a, as a, as a counterpart to the US. So, in fact, you know, uh, Under Secretary Victoria Nolan mentioned after uh, Secretary Blinken met with uh, Foreign Minister Wangi of China that, you know, we would want China to intervene with Russia, not to invade Ukraine. Why would China do that? I think China is very happy <laughs> to see tensions. The other point, I, I want to slightly differ with the Professor Korobko about this, about sanctions driving Russia into China, that China will compensate uh, Russia for the impact of sanctions uh, by Europe. I think the evidence is not so clear there. You know, even during the, these sanctions where, uh, which have been imposed so far, Chinese companies have actually been very careful to try to avoid contracts which would uh, result in US sanctions. And this has been a bit of a uh, Russian, I mean, I know when I, was, when I was serving in Russia, I've seen this also. It's a bit of a Russian unhappiness about that. Also, China has been driving very hard bargains on uh, energy uh, purchases from uh, Russia and changing the goalposts when uh, the prices go down and so on. And thirdly, you know, Russia has this huge uh, investment in gas pipelines to Europe. And it, it cannot get out of that and compensate for it overnight with Chinese uh, sales. So I think Russia needs Europe as well, as much as Europe needs Russia. Europe, Europe cannot overnight. I mean, I heard uh, uh, EC Commission uh, uh, President uh, von der Leyen saying today that if Russia, if Gazprom stops gas uh, uh, supplies to, uh, to Europe, we, we, we have tied up our supplies uh, from uh, elsewhere for this winter. I don't see how that's possible. There is not that much slack in the gas market. And it, and it means, you know, having to buy LNG, degasified, gasified, degasified. It's not possible. So there is this interdependence which you cannot get away from. Oh, uh, Vidya, I'll... Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I completely agree that there would not be a, a complete compensation right now by China for the Western sanctions. 
I was talking about the long-term effects when uh, uh, new pipelines will be built and it will take time. Uh, but there is an issue of vulnerability. It's uh, an issue, for example, for the US, uh, when Trump started tariff wars and started to uh, introduce different blocks uh, for the trade between the US uh, and China, uh, it already was uh, clearly visible that uh, if economies are uh, interpenetrated, uh, uh, well, any kind of sanctions, uh, any kind of uh, uh, such prohibitive uh, measures, they would uh, impact both sides. And uh, uh, while the effect on the Russian economy will be uh, very harmful, the question is uh, uh, about the relative terms. And uh, uh, in a democratic country, especially a country like the US, where the elections take place every two years, uh, it will uh, have a, an immediate bearing on uh, ratings. And uh, in uh, Biden's case specifically, any downward uh, well pressure on his ratings and Democrats' ratings would would become a total political disaster. Uh, Putin does not have to care about ratings at least uh, uh, that much. So uh, it is a problem in relations between the U.S. and Russia. It will be a disastrous problem in the relations between the U.S. and China in the future because of uh, very different let's put it this way, time perception in, uh, <clears throat> in two countries. Uh, considering uh, the impact of in on India specifically, it is clear that uh, the balance ex that existed during the Cold War is changing very quickly. It concerns the improvement of relations between Russia and China uh, that were extremely hostile uh, at the end of uh, the 20th century. Uh, there is an improvement of relations between India and the United States. Uh, there is a very uh, um, well complicated situation in regard to the position of Pakistan within this triangle. Uh, and uh, the further it goes, the more complicated relations will be. But uh, all the sides are interested in good relations with India for different uh, reasons. And I think it will be a, a very um, well complicated factor in terms of uh, uh, Russian relations with China. Rus uh, Russia would continue to be very interested in good relations uh, with India, and it will resist uh, Chinese attempts to uh, well put up specific demands in this in this regard. Uh, a very important factor here uh, is also uh, the issue of Islamic fundamentalism. It spread all the countries involved. Uh, that means uh, Russia, China, <clears throat> India, and the United States <clears throat> are viewing it with uh, great apprehension, uh, apprehension. And that's one of a few areas where cooperation will probably uh, uh, developing and developing pretty intensely. Uh, but otherwise, uh, of course, uh, for India, it's uh, a very touchy strategically issue. The uh, change of balance, change of tone in the relations of these three uh, giants. Uh, thank you. I think this may be a good time to pivot to uh, audience questions for a while. Uh, and uh, we'll come back in for closing comments. Uh, and Marshal Mateshwaran, um, how should we do this? Should, should I just read the questions from the chat, invite questions from the participants? Vidya, you can do both. You can read out from the chat as well as uh, invite uh, questions from the participants. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let me start with um, the question, um, just to bring it back to Russia, Ukraine. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, to what extent has Russia been prepared for a continuous confrontation over Ukraine with the West in terms of uh, the economy, trade, and diplomacy? I think both of you have touched upon aspects of this. Uh, and, and one of the things I'd like to add here is uh, who's in the driver's seat uh, in this um, uh, ability to um, 
turn on and off the conflict? Uh, it's a very complicated issue. Relations between Russia and Ukraine uh, have uh, as much significance for Russia as relations with, uh, with the United States. Uh, besides uh, other issues, for example, the uh, conceptual vision, and Putin has recently stated the fact that there is no real difference between Russians and Ukrainians, and something needs to be done about it in his article that he published last year. But besides that, uh, Ukraine was one of two major routes of Russian goods uh, to the West. The second is Belarus. So uh, the result of the Ukrainian crisis was the uh, breakup of all normal uh, economic links, uh, land-based mm -hmm. links between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, that has tremendously increased the strategic value of Belarus. And it was shown in the last two years that under no circumstances, uh, uh, Russia would let Belarus go away, at mm -hmm. least to uh, any degree. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, Russia is not ready, first of all, economically for uh, the new crisis and for uh, the new breakup. Uh, the question is, uh, whose interests are at stake? Uh, Russian, Putin's, American, Biden's. And uh, uh, very frequently here, we uh, are encountering a situation when, uh, uh, well, personal vision and personal interests uh, outweigh the uh, national ones. But Russia, in principle, is not uh, uh, ready to bear new sanctions, first of all, in the economic sphere. But at the same time, it's clear that political leadership is willing to, uh, well, um, accept this uh, e economic blow. Uh, and it's hard to say what about the population. In 2014, when uh, uh, there was a change of power in Ukraine, uh, the majority of the population uh, strongly supported the operation in Crimea. Uh, well, was relatively positively inclined towards the uh, developments, let me put it this way, in Donbas region. Right now, it is clear that there is no strong support for military operation in Ukraine. Of course, again, uh, for Russian leadership, it's not as important as, say, uh, public opinion uh, in the West. But still, it is a, an issue, it is a, an important factor. And we see that the current crisis is paralleled by uh, a very significant tightening of the screws within the country uh, in terms of uh, freedom of speech, in terms of freedom of political activity. And if it comes to military crisis, it's clear that the impact will be much more severe than now. Uh, uh, Ambassador Raghavan, would you like to weigh in? Very briefly, just uh, to say that probably at this stage, President Putin senses that uh, the US interest in Ukraine may be waning a little, that Europe is also keen to have a settlement and to move on, at least part of Europe the Franco-German uh, part of Europe, would also want to move on from Ukraine. So perhaps, you know, certainly I agree with uh, Professor that this uh, invasion is not going to be popular. And in spite of the fact that popularity is not as big a concern of President Putin as the best, he still there's no reason for him to do it because there is nothing that he can actually achieve from it, if he can achieve, which he can achieve without a war. So I think he may be sensing that he may get a settlement now because of these twin factors of the U.S. being less uh, inclined to push for uh, Ukraine and, and, and the part of Europe itself feeling that it should move on from Ukraine. It's not, uh, I mean, I think you can see that Ukraine probably senses that as well from the manner in which Ukraine is reacting publicly to what is going on. So that is where I think the, uh, and, and, and let us remember one thing, you know, about Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine's current position as, uh, you know, aspiring for NATO and so on, was actually a US-led operation. 
Mm. If you go back to 2008 at the Bucharest summit, NATO summit, it was the US that pushed Poland and others to, to get NATO to uh, say that, you know, Georgian and Ukrainian aspirations for NATO, uh, we will recognize. So it, it all rested on US support. And if US support weakens, I think <laughs> there will be a change in the way people look at Ukraine. Uh, to to uh, go into a little bit of uh, Russian-Ukrainian history, one of the questions is about uh, the relationship between Ukraine and um, uh, Russia. Ukraine was part of the USSR. Why are Ukrainians against Russians? Uh, and the other question that's sort of related to uh, the current situation is um, whether Ukraine is against Russian bases or Navy in their ports because Ukraine sees this as an interference in their sovereignty. Uh, Professor Karapkov. Well, India is a country that very well knows uh, how painful the processes of uh, state and nation building are. And here is the problem, uh, exactly because Ukrainians and Russians are so close, uh, the level of hostility right now, political hostility, is uh, very high. Uh, ironically, what happened in the last eight years has uh, helped to form Ukrainian nation much more than all the efforts of Ukrainian governments since 1991. So the, the emergence of an external threat has led to really the formation of uh, kind of national consciousness. Up to that moment, Ukrainian population, I already mentioned it, consisted of three parts. So ethnic Russians, uh, Eastern Ukrainians, Western Ukrainians. And uh, uh, the story uh, for 25 years was that of uh, struggles uh, for leadership who would define the identity of new state of a new nation. Uh, the elite was deeply divided uh, and uh, uh, it has left some space for the formation of uh, a civic society in Ukraine and at least uh, uh, the competition at the elite level between among those uh, different groups of elite. And uh, the emergence of crisis of a threat has helped uh, uh, them to consolidate their control, consolidate their positions, and uh, uh, push forward uh, the formation of uh, Ukrainian national consciousness. So that's, that's the irony of this uh, situation. Uh, right now, uh, the voluntary return under the uh, some kind of Russian uh, post-imperial umbrella because of that, uh, would become practically impossible. If this threat is gone, then uh, the differences will probably pop up. But the situation is aggravated by uh, the horrible uh, economic situation, corruption, and migration. Uh, when Ukraine was formed, there were 52 million living in that country. It uh, has lost 2 million in Crimea, 2 million in Donbas, 2 million of refugees to Russia, more than 2 million of refugees to Poland and the West, uh, plus uh, the uh, natural uh, population decline. And right now the population is about 40 million. Uh, basically it's a demographic disaster from 52 to 40 uh, within a 30 year period. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's a tragic basically situation but it also has led, I will reiterate it one more time, uh, to the formation of uh, more or less uh, uh, defined, uh, both legally and uh, at the conscious level of the Ukrainian nation and Ukrainian nation state. It's kind of ironic. Putin became the creator of Ukrainian nation. Um, Ambassador Raghavan, um... Let me very briefly uh, touch on this aspect. I think, you know, you can't get away from two factors here. One is that Eastern Ukraine is economically very greatly dependent on Russia in terms of, uh, and I know this because some of the uh, uh, organizations which I'm involved in also, uh, even, even today, 
the part of uh, the parts of eastern Ukraine not within Donbas, not within the control of the mission, is still doing extensive trade with Russia, and that trade is continuing, by the way, through all this crisis. So that dependence on Russia of eastern Ukraine and this beyond the Donbas. I mean, I'm talking about eastern Ukraine from the east of that Dnieper River, and in fact, in the south, it, it even goes as far as Odessa. When you talk about the Russian ethno-culturally Russian people, so. Uh, while what the professor says about uh, the Russian threat uniting the country is true, as he says himself, the moment the Russian threat is, seems to be lifted, differences will crop up again because there is a very strong anti-Russian uh, uh, Russian language uh, uh, trend within the uh, government in Kiev. In fact, one of the first things that it did was it removed Russia as an official Russian as an official language. So these differences could well crop up again because I think. The, uh, that is the point that President Putin was making, actually, that much of Ukraine is different from the rest of Ukraine. And that is a difference that I think could well come up. And when it comes to, you know, Ukraine, as, as the professor said, demographically, it is a destroyed country. But economically as well, it's a destroyed country. So the rehabilitation of Ukraine, the economic rehabilitation of Ukraine is going to be a very difficult task. And who's going to help in that? And that may create uh, divisions as well. So we don't know. I mean, it's something that we need to see uh, whether or not uh, how uh, uh, Ukraine, which is uh, where the Russian threat is removed, will react vis-a-vis -vis Russia and vis-a-vis -vis Europe. And how European Union will react vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Will the European Union be willing to sink in the millions and billions of dollars in order to help Ukrainian reconstruction? That's not very clear. So, you know, eventually <laughs> Ukraine's future will be decided by these factors. Um, let, let's circle back then to EU and NATO. And um, if um, you recall, part of the challenge in 2014 was um, Ukrainian membership in the EU. And um, Putin wanted uh, Ukraine to be part of the uh, Eurasian Union. And, and as you said very clearly, um, I don't think the EU wants to be left holding the bag. I mean, for the EU, they'd like to have um, Russia pay the costs and the EU reap the benefits of a, a relationship uh, with Ukraine. So um, the circling back has to do with um, what are the possible benefits for the West uh, in having Ukraine either in NATO or in the EU, given the very um, um, staunch position of the United States that this is a... Um, giving into uh, Putin's demands is a non-negotiable position. And, and, and you know what, the last question here was, is NATO overreach the reason for um, the crisis in the first place? And you can address that as well. Uh, on the last one, I would say yes. Uh, and uh, the strategic uh, reasons uh, are not quite clear. Uh, the official explanation right now, we cannot give written guarantees that we would not admit uh, uh, Ukraine to NATO. It's because we respect its sovereignty and it should have a right to join NATO. Of course, uh, from the point of view of uh, geopolitics, uh, interests of major players, uh, this is a kind of superficial argument. And uh, uh, that's where Putin will keep uh, hitting it. So quite frankly, nobody was going to admit NATO to Ukraine. It's uh, just uh, grandstanding on the part of the West. E even if Putin said, yes, you will take them, there is no chance Ukraine would be admitted. That's the irony of it. Same uh, concerns Georgia, same concerns Moldova. Uh, as long as there is uh, Article 5 of the NATO Charter, nobody would want to admit uh, a country that has territorial conflicts in its territory and tensions with, uh, with a great power. The EU is a different matter because it's uh, a huge market. It's a huge uh, uh, well, uh, area of uh, very important resources. Uh, uranium, uh, well, high quality coal, agricultural lands, and uh, uh, still some remaining uh, Soviet military industrial uh, infrastructure uh, in the East. And well, 
first of all, labor resources and demographic resources that are important for many European countries. So uh, the admittance to uh, the EU or at least some kind of uh, association agreement uh, the, of the type that was already signed is quite possible. But in regard to NATO, again, it's, it's a pure politics for the internal consumption primarily. Uh, nobody wants to see it there and nobody frankly will see it there but it's a grandstanding for the internal consumption and uh, well, another attempt to form, uh, to retain the great uh, power status for Europe in general. Uh, the UK recently, I already mentioned that the UK uh, is moving in trying to fill in the vacuum. The UK has formed uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, micro alliance uh, with Ukraine and Poland. What is the military significance of uh, uh, well, uh, the UK, Poland, uh, Ukraine alliance? They could invite the Luxembourg or Liechtenstein to, uh, well, to uh, increase the numbers. Militarily, it's nothing uh, more than that. It's uh, basically danger to uh, the UK because potentially uh, it can be dragged into direct conflict uh, with uh, Russia. So I'll just repeat, the NATO is relevant as long as the US guarantees security of its European allies. If uh, the US is gone, uh, NATO might become vice versa liability, not uh, a factor of uh, security for those countries. And thus they are doing everything possible to uh, make the US stay. Uh, but the question is what, will the US position in the long run uh, be. It is clear that um, one of the factors that have led to the start of this uh, uh, current crisis is exactly the fact that the US withdraws uh, step by step. Uh, it is understood by all major players and uh, the emergence of geopolitical vacuum is always extremely dangerous. Let's remember the Balkans uh 1914 and here is a, a very similar situation thank you uh ambassador Raghavan? Yeah, the second part of your question yeah i agree entirely with the professor that nato there's no question of uh, ukraine or georgia entering nato nato will not be able to give a, uh, a commitment even if they did it's not worth the paper it would be written on but as long as russia occupies crimea and as long as South Ossetia and Abkhazia remain uh, out of the control of Georgia, there's no way NATO principles will permit NATO to admit them. So that's something that Russia will have to live with. It will not get a, a, an assurance, anything beyond that. As long as it is allowed to stay on in Crimea, I think that's secure. The first part, I didn't quite get the point of the first part of your question, actually. The first part of what you said. Uh, the, the first part is just uh, the... Um question that was in the chat, which is, are we in this situation because NATO, because of the post-Cold War expansion of NATO, that NATO um, expands beyond uh, not just Eastern Europe, but uh, the Baltics and uh, creates a situation of tension with Russia? No, no, that's absolutely true. And I think the professor mentioned it even in his opening remarks. The, the expansion of NATO to Russia's borders, that is what has caused this. But having said that, it's not going to be rolled back. And even Russia's demands that the military infrastructure in uh, NATO should be rolled back to pre-1997 NATO countries is not going to be happen. However, that concern will be addressed in the mutual security guarantees basket bucket, because there you will see what, what missiles and what kind of weaponry will be placed there. And I think it will definitely be part of that, that NATO uh, missile systems would not be placed in Ukraine. And maybe even this, this European missile shield, which is in Romania and Poland, that will also get covered in this mutual security guarantees. I think that will get covered. So certainly, however, you know, uh, the point is they were pushing an open door at that time. Russia was weak. Russia was weak, weak politically. It was weak economically. It was weak socially. And therefore, they just took advantage of this and, and reached wherever they could reach. And today, Russia feels that it is in a position to push back. And that is why we are seeing this uh, drama. But also, I think 
Europe is ready for a new security order. And what we are seeing is, is also Europe positioning itself for a new security order. So depending on how this resolves itself, you will also see over a period of time, Europe positioning itself differently. Of course, it has to sort out its own political, social, and cultural uh, economic problems within Europe as well. But I think that's where we are going right now. Um, one of the interesting issues that is, yes. Um... Uh, just one uh, point that I want to, uh, one question that I want to raise was uh, also to re uh, recall, uh, if you remember what uh, Sam Nunn pointed out in his uh, address in Atlanta in 2016, in the ISA annual convention, he was very critical of uh, the American, the NATO expansion, and he had predicted that this is what will entirely lead to ultimately. So I believe this, this is also the uh, issue that reflects the larger conflict of the international system of trying to whittle down the overbearance of the American system. And probably China also plays the role in the background. But coming to the second part, what Ambassador uh, Raghman pointed out is the interdependency of Ukraine and Russia, particularly in the technology and the defense domain has been extensive. Notwithstanding all the efforts, you know, uh, listening to the European uh, Union as well as the American uh, promises, not much has materialized, as I would say, other than they have leveraged some of the excellent technologies that the Ukrainians have had. So in, India has a stake because India has interest in deriving or expanding the benefits that we've leveraged so far. And China has been a very big, you know, a success story in leveraging their contracts both with Russia and with Ukraine. Now, the Antonov is a big, you know, uh, supporter and advisor for the aerospace success in China in many of their programs, including the civil airliner program as well. So ultimately, where is this going to lead to from a Ukrainian perspective and from their national interest? Uh, because internally, when you speak to some of these industries, they are, they are saying, let's get back to the old times. Let's live with the Russian and let's work beneficially in economic terms and technology terms to work with each other. So I would uh, probably... Uh, because Ambassador Raghavan and Andre to speak on this. And, and you can just treat this as your closing comments as well in, in responding to this question. Okay, may I? Uh, no, actually, uh, Air Marshal refers to <laughs> a very important point there because uh, he knows very well uh, how we are dealing with Ukraine and Russia. And there are certain technologies that Ukraine has, which is required to be uh, integrated into systems which are buying from Russia. And, and those are not going to go to the West because they, they don't uh, meld with the, the Western systems. So there are these issues which are very important issues of integration which uh, Ukraine has, which, which you cannot run away from. And, and, and therefore, I think uh, economic integration of Ukraine with the EU is much further away than economic integration of Ukraine with Russia, given the state of the industry it has, and because of the Soviet legacy as well. And, and, and therefore, that's a, that's a very important point that uh, is there. You know, there's this uh, oligarch, Kolomoisky, Ihor Kolomoisky, who's supposed to be the, the patron of uh, uh, the, the president, uh, Zelensky, as well. He has written about this. He wrote this in a New York Times article, actually, a couple of years ago, I think, uh, already. Uh, saying that, you know, the, the uh, Americans will fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. <laughs> so, so Ukraine needs to save itself. Well, that's an exaggeration, of course, he's uh, giving a point of view. But so this is an important point that uh, the air marshal raises. Now, as far as closing remarks go, I think I've actually said uh, in my opening remarks, what should be the closing remark? I think this is a struggle for uh, uh, America to reorient, recalibrate its position in Europe, to recalibrate its uh, strategic compass further eastwards. It is Russia taking advantage of this uh, particular objective to see what it can get for itself, how it can get back into Europe after having been nudged out of Europe, and also for Europe to see how it can resolve a security order. You know, unlike the First World War and the Second World War, the security order in Europe post-Cold War did not come out of any agreements between powers. It just happened. And Russia lost out on it. 
And, and Europe also, in a way, lost out on it by being tied to the Euro-Atlantic alliance longer than what I would call its use-by date. And therefore, it is probably seeing now whether it can sort out. So these are the various issues involved. And, on, in the, and the elephant in the room, as everybody mentioned, is China, which is waiting to see how which way this goes, because it can take advantage of this, uh, depending on which way it goes. Thank you. Uh, Professor Korobkov. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, China is present everywhere in uh, uh, the uh, any discussions uh, um, of relations between Russia and the US, uh, Russia and the West. And uh, China was very aggressively moving into Ukraine uh, until quite recently, uh, buying uh, companies, uh, buying land, uh, uh, acting. Uh, very, very actively. And the US uh, well perceives it uh, uh, as a very uh, significant threat. And then kind of surprisingly, uh, well, China took sides. I think that uh, the reason for, for that besides geopolitics is Taiwan and the creation of particular precedent. And of course there at least theoretically exists the most nightmarish scenario for the West. It's a simultaneous operation of China in Taiwan and uh, Russia in Ukraine. And I'm pretty sure that this issue was raised, but behind the closed doors. So uh, this process will continue. And uh, uh, quite frankly, the West is in such a situation when uh, time is working against it. Uh, every day, basically, the relative share of Europe uh, uh, in the world economy is declining and with it declining its uh, political and military influence. Uh, and uh, uh, that's what Putin very clearly essentially has stated both uh, in his words and in his actions. 15 years ago, we asked you to change the rules of the game. You refused to do it. Now we demand the change of uh, the rules of the game. Uh, okay, if you don't uh, uh, do it now, next time it will be much worse. That basically is uh, his tone. And uh, objectively speaking, this is really so. Uh, but uh, it's very hard to accept that you uh, are not what uh, you used to be. Every empire in the world had to deal with it, uh, be it Britain, France, Turkey, Russia, uh, and right now, the West in general is finding itself in uh, uh, this situation. It's very painful, uh, and you can try to adjust yourself to a new situation, or uh, life will make you uh, uh, well accept this reality uh, sometime in the future. Uh, the problem uh, for the United States in this regard is uh, uh, the fact that uh, this uh, uh, total realignment is overlapping with the deep in internal systemic crisis in the US. And uh, uh, the uh, elite is in a very tough position. It's uh, uh, very hard for it to recognize some changes because it will hurt its political positions as well. And therefore, I expect this process to be very long and uh, very painful, basically. Uh, but uh, I will probably uh, wrap it up with the same words that uh, I started it with. Uh, Ukrainian crisis is basically mostly not about Ukraine. It's about the general revision of the rules of the game and the recognition of new balance and uh, uh, tragically for Ukraine, it became a scapegoat, uh, kind of an exchangeable unit uh, for uh, great power politics. And this will not change in the foreseeable future. Thank you. On this optimistic note, I suppose, we can wrap it up. Um, thank you, Ambassador Raghavan and uh, Professor Koropkov. And with that, I'll hand it over back to you, Air Marshal Mateshwaran. Thank you, Vidya. This has been an excellent and a very intellectually very stimulating, you know, conversation uh, to listen to. Uh, thank you, Ambassador uh, Raghavan, for being with us. It's, 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 your inputs are fabulous. 
and uh, Professor Andre, it's a pleasure listening to you. And uh, the uh, the views are excellent. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Vidya, for moderating this so beautifully and uh, so elegantly. It's a pleasure on, uh, for Peninsula Foundation to have had all three of you on the panel today. Thank you so much. And let me hand over to Madhuvati to give the closing. Let me thank you also to uh, both the Peninsula Foundation, our excellent moderator, as well as Professor Karapkov. It was a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Madhuvanti. Yes. Thank you, sir. I agree. It was a very interesting and an enlightening discussion of the Ukraine crisis and the power play by Russia, US, and NATO behind it. And I'm sure the discussion has also given us a better clarity on what uh, are the implications for the rest of the world, especially India and China. Uh, so on uh, behalf of the Peninsula Foundation, I would like to express my gratitude to Ambassador Raghavan, Dr. Korobko, and Dr. Natkarni for spending time and sharing their thoughts and inputs with us. I would also like to thank Air Marshall for chairing this session today and also the participants for their attendance and interest in our event. I hope you all enjoyed our panel discussion today and hope to see you at another interesting event soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Vidya, for, and sorry for pulling out so early in the morning and so also for Andre. Thank you very much. Thank you.